someone's get whacked tonight. Back in 2021, when Deathloop was gearing up for release on the PS5 as a timed exclusive, creative director Dinga Bacaba said that Arcane Leon was out to give players something they will really enjoy, something they'll remember, something they'll talk about, maybe something they'll hate, but at least something that doesn't leave them feeling apathy. Apathy is the enemy of what we do. Well, Mr. Bacaba, if apathy is the enemy, then I hate to break it to you, but I'm in bed with the enemy on this one. But I didn't want it to be this way. I love what Arcane stands for, an attention to craft and risk-reward design amidst an ocean of shooting-for-the-middle AAA sludge. But I'll be the first to admit that I bounce off a lot of Arcane's games at first, despite how great the back of the tin reads. Dishonors wobbly controls in touchy stealth or Arcs Vitalis' spellcasting. I'm looking at you. But I can't deny Bacaba's next point. Arcane games are not fast food, they're cuisine. So maybe you don't like the taste, but at least there is this taste and has a personality. Amen. So when Deathloop came out guns blazing with a colorful, high-octane trailer, unlike any of the dour, immersive sims Arcane was known for, I raised a quizzical eyebrow but took notice. I'm an edgelord, so the vibe didn't do much for me, but the pitch of a so-called murder puzzle where you traverse different time periods to kill eight bad guys before the time loop reset sounded amazing. And on paper, Deathloop is a daring evolution of Arcane's style. Its writing is wacky and foul-mouthed, its Far Cry-style stealth or shooter gameplay is the slickest Arcane's ever made, and its innovative gameplay hook of reliving the same day over and over should be the stuff of roguelite, Dark Souls, and Hitman Euphoria. And yet, Deathloop somehow manages to be technically all the things it promised, and yet lack most of the highs of the games it recalls. And this is Arcane's most critically acclaimed to date, and sales weren't half bad either. But if you look closer at forums and social media, you'll find that, just like Bacaba predicted, people tend to either love it or hate it. And as I played more and more trying unsuccessfully to find the magic, I even began to ask myself, am I just a hater? Was I unfairly holding this game up to the standards set by Dishonored or Prey or other immersive sim-style games when Deathloop was truly an original, to be judged on its own merit? Having now completed Deathloop twice, and the whole Dishonored series again, and for context, I feel pretty justified in saying that Deathloop's well-intentioned and at times brilliantly conceived, but executed with so much reserve that it can't help but feel half-baked. To Dinga Bacaba's likely disdain, I found myself growing more and more apathetic towards Deathloop, autopiloting my way through my second playthrough and not being able to stomach a third playthrough to keep me fresh during the writing process. But let's bring out the evidence, and you can decide for yourself whether the Deathloop is worth breaking or whether it's just broken. First off, let's revisit Deathloop's launch trailer that likely introduced most of us to the game. The highlight reel kills, mixing powers and guns to the fun 60s Bond if it were a black exploitation film is a really cool vibe that just feels right. The game doesn't look like it takes itself too seriously, from the hokey movie delivery of the voiceovers to the generally bright color palette and bouncy animations. This thing's got style and it looks like it's really about fun, right? Well, for the most part, that vibe plays out in the game proper, but I wish it went farther than a vibe. The story goes nowhere beyond one twist that's glossed over almost immediately. The only thing to look forward to is the perfect assassination chain once you've figured out everything you need to know about the aforementioned eight targets. The dialogue is bratty, petty, and abominably stupid, turning the air blue with creative compound curses that'd make your granny blush. Talk and work, you shit cock motherfucker! Hey. Ah. Oh, what the fuck, man? Piece of shit won't start! There are no real characters or motivations to consider here, so if the repetitive gameplay loop isn't doing it for fun, sorry, there's not much other motivation to continue. And let's be honest, Arcane Leon's last set of stories in the Dishonored universe weren't very well written either, but they had their cool plot points, right? Dowd's DLC was quite good and made him feel like more than a cardboard cutout. I have a soft spot for Billy Lurk's arc in the Death of the Outsider DLC, too. Unfortunately, Deathloop pulls a tone-deaf move by turning the dial way too far in the other direction by giving everyone a dial tone for a brainwave, and is insufferable as a result. What kind of fucked up world is this? Ah! 
But if you can withstand the awful delivery, the game's lore and sense of place are unsurprisingly as good as arcane stuff usually is. The game takes place on the technologically advanced Black Reef Island of the 1960s, which had many clandestine experiments done here by Operation Horizon dating back to the 1930s. The reason for all this attention is that the island is the site of a temporal anomaly that gradually overtook the whole island and made those stuck within it relive the same day over and over again, resurrecting any dead people and setting the day's events in motion again. Once the anomaly got to this point, the Eon program set up shop. Eon is comprised of technologists and artisans called visionaries and their underlings, the Eternalists. This group of self-involved, super-powered eccentrics is looking to preserve the island as a bohemian paradise, and they bicker, fight, and screw like Twin Peaks characters. The Visionaries started out nine strong, but one of their most important members named Colt Vaughn had since rebelled against this purgatorial existence because he wanted to get back to his family, and he begins looking for a way out, discovering that killing off all of his fellow Visionaries by day's end will break the loop. Now, the idea that the loop is tied to the Visionaries' life forces is a bit contrived, but may have something to do with the superpowers the anomaly gave them, but it's never quite explained. Now, I won't fault them too much for this since it's a pretty cool design conceit. Will you just hurry up already? All right, all fine and dandy, but it's more complicated than that, as evidenced by the fact that the game opens with a woman named Juliana knifing your character Colt Vaughn to death. Instead of dying, however, Colt awakes on a beach, seemingly hungover and remembering very little. Juliana taunts Colt that they've done this dance many times before. She's every bit as aware of Colt is of the time loop, also called the longest day. So not only do you have to piece together your own jumbled memory of your main mission and how to carry it out, you'll also have to contend with a capable and knowledgeable adversary. In theory, all these ingredients sound incredibly rich with possibility, and before I sat down to play the game, I was even a little intimidated, as my reference point for such a game was still Hitman, a series rife with variables like guard patrols or special NPC actions that operate on a timer and can be influenced or taken advantage of. Alas, Alas, the truth of Deathloop's scope is much less impressive than it first seems, whereas the other time travel game of 2021, The Forgotten City, did a masterful job of making you plan around timed objectives, Deathloop settles for a banal and prescriptive method of executing the loop concept, essentially turning it into a linear first-person shooter with more steps. And while it's easy for me to say, I don't think it had to be this way, and I can only dream of what this game's elevator pitch would have played like had the game really gone for broke. Arcane made an understandable but paradoxically crippling move when they narrowed the game's vision to realistic standards, but compromised the very scope and inventiveness the vision needed to be interesting. But this wasn't a mere snap decision, as this focus on streamlining and accessibility had been brewing for quite a while. While Dishonored was a pretty big hit for Arcane, selling 3 million copies on PC alone, Dishonored 2 only sold 2.5 million copies on consoles and PC combined, and the death of the Outsider DLC didn't make a splash either. Arcane Studios soon went on hiatus in the aftermath of even their most lucrative property bottoming out financially. So not only was financial return on Arcane's mind as they regrouped and planned out their next project, but Dinga Bacaba admits that the team was fairly sensitive to the negative feedback from Dishonored players who felt left out or left behind because they couldn't readily pull off all the highlight reel stunts that they'd seen others do. Now, my gut reaction was, this is not Arcane's problem. I missed the part where that's my problem. You know, if you simply lack the ingenuity to make the game fun. But I had to admit that the Anway generated by my first Dishonored playthrough resulted from how much easier it was to just blink around the map stabbing guys over and over than to try and execute Rube Goldberg level combos that shocked and awed. So I get why Arcane wanted to break this negative feedback loop, though Deathloop's trailer was nothing but outrageous highlight reel clips, so go figure. But Deathloop accommodates this no man left behind mentality too much, spreading various borrowed tropes so thin that the gameplay feels less like a greatest hits collection and more like a patch working a better experiences than this one. At least it does once you get past the fairly dense and intimidating tutorial, which makes you think the game is going to be way more complicated and interesting than it actually is. The tutorial took me over three hours to get through on my first playthrough. Now, granted the first time I played, I scoured every inch of the levels like you do in arcane games, not realizing that the game really just wanted me to follow the waypoints until further notice, picking up integral mechanics and abilities along the way so that I could organically learn and get ready for the loop proper. I figured out how to hack, to assassinate people from behind, to mark enemies, unlock access to buffs for me and my gear called trinkets, unlock the superpowers called slabs, 
and unlock Residuum, a currency you can suck up from the environment or dead visionaries to enchant your weapons and gear so that it stays in your inventory permanently throughout all the ensuing loops. Most important of all, I learned about the gameplay loop itself. At the beginning of each new instance of the loop, you awake on the aforementioned beach and have to travel up to a bunker where you'll be able to choose your loadout and decide which area of the island you want to go to first, starting in the morning. The day progresses from morning to noon to afternoon and then to night, each phase of the day giving you a choice of four different areas of the island to explore and gather intel on your targets or even try and take them out if you're ready. Each phase has a different set of objectives within it to complete, and especially so depending on how far along in the quest lines you are. Some areas may eventually hold nothing of narrative significance for you, but no matter what, they all differ in their configurations. Enemies may be plentiful at one time of day or totally gone in another, doors may be locked or unlocked, and sometimes certain times of day are the only times in which characters will be in the same location. So you'll have to be very careful to get the most out of each visit and not squander them before the day reaches night and reset your progress. Be careful too, because for every area you enter, you've only got two deaths you can withstand because of your reprisal ability, which will resurrect you and rewind you about five seconds or so before your death to let you try again. Die a third time though, and the loop entirely resets. So not only will you have your targets and their cronies to contend with, but Juliana can invade your game like a Dark Souls phantom, and she'll be controlled either by an AI or another player as your settings prefer, locking your escape routes until you can hack them back online and not leaving an area until you've killed her. But when you're finally done in each area, you can escape through the bunkers you came through to get here and the island will transform into the next phase of the day and you'll have your choice of which of the four areas you want to go to next. This all sounds pretty badass, right? Well, like I said, the tutorial's kind of a weird misdirect because it shows you the levels in their sprawling, detailed glory, but then rushes you through them until it's sufficiently unlocked all the crap you need to actually engage the gameplay loop, during which you can then explore like you'd expect. This is significant because while there's some truly clever areas to mess about in, so much of the game feels this prescriptive. The exploratory incidental stuff you do in immersive sims like find passwords or codes or little lore tips about how to bypass or defeat enemies isn't present here. Instead, the stuff you find is really just like finding keys to unlock quest log updates before you need to move on to the next area and repeat. You'll also spend a lot of time in menus, and there are menus for all the clues cleaned at different times of day, your different visionary quest lines, as well as ones for your slabs and unlockable special weapons found in the levels. And not only is there a lot of info to parse, but there's no quick map option at all, and this menu is the source of multiple bugs, like the one where the screen will go blank and not let you resume your game, or how interaction points will disappear so that you have to either restart your whole loop or wait until your entire next loop to try them again. But if you can get past this opening slog, you'll start to get into a roguelite rhythm, snatching up as many trinkets and weapons and information as possible before leaving. And as the game opens up, you'll finally start to be able to pause and marvel at how pretty and well designed the levels are. Deathloop is a dedicated current-gen game, not something throttled into visual mediocrity by being available for the last generation of consoles, and boy does it show. This is to date the best looking game I've played on my Xbox Series X. The color contrast is rich, the textures are pristine, and some micro detail like the crags in the opening level may be procedurally generated, but man do they look handcrafted and decent. DECENT! And don't let me forget the awesome architecture like these giant faces attached to the sides of buildings and mountains. Oh, and while we're on presentation, I need to shout out the fantastic score here really quickly. The music has this jazzy, theatrical swell of a James Bond theme, but can range from mysterious and ethereal to soulful at a moment's notice. It's an organic, rich blend of sonic textures, and aside from one awful track we'll get to later, it's incredibly produced and arranged, so kudos here. Now, not only does the game look great, but it has Arcane's smartest and most sprawling maps to Date. There's a ton of incidental details packed in, like an overchoice of alternate paths, little side quests, and tons of hidden content, most of which I still can't find on my own, unfortunately. Some levels, like Frank's Club, are excellent from an immersive sim standpoint, having three distinct entry points, like a platforming challenge over ice cold water, to grabbing a class pass at the front door that'll turn off your powers but allow you entry. <laughs> This kind of choice is awesome, and the reward of discovery when you followed your intuition is such a pleasing rush. But this is one of the few examples where Deathloop was in the zone. So much of the rest of the game feels like its edges were shorn off or like it was tamped down not to trip you up. Despite perusing every last corner, there were so many optional side quests I couldn't complete because the clues were so vague or because I didn't even know they were there. In addition to Deathloop having the most difficult to parse puzzles Arcane's ever made, the rewards for completing these puzzles are often pretty mediocre. 
better, netting you barely better trinkets or an okay power weapon that's not really going to feel worth the effort. I'd like to be able to defer to the, you know, I'm a lazy bonehead who doesn't like to be challenged, and that could just explain why I got so little out of Deathloop's side content, but it felt almost like it didn't even want to be found to be enjoyed in the first place. Factor in how easy it is to fall into the ice water and instantly die, and your exploration becomes even less enjoyable. I mean, missing out on this stuff isn't the end of the world, but let's get to why the face-up level and quest design everyone will see loses its luster quite a bit. While it's great fun to run across rooftops like Batman and teleport around like Nightcrawler, all the open space you see rarely feels conducive to making fights interesting, and sometimes it lets you get away with way too much, avoiding almost half a level worth of obstacles. Take the complex level for instance. At the beginning, you're presented with two big lanes to go down in order to progress through the level. Either a very jammed up area of old machinery with tons of Eternalists inside of it, or a wide open road to the left with only one Eternalist you can easily kill and get all the way to the next area unscathed. This is certainly the silliest instance of this, but it's not the only one. Rooftops can also feel big enough to run track meets on, and this may just be a side effect of having intricate buildings inside of them that, you know, make the outside look bigger than it needs to be. I also wonder if this was just to accommodate the multiplayer component of the game, giving players a temptingly high vantage point to survey from, but incurring a lot of risk at being so easy to be spotted by the opposing player. Either way, there's so much open space in some of these levels, it often means that there are too many places for your multiplayer opponent to camp out at. And that's not even considering how annoying it makes tracking the AI-controlled Eternalist once they start manically skittering around. These guys are some of the most simplistic but also irritating enemies I have ever encountered in an FPS-style game. Which is too bad, because the action itself is Arcane's best so far. Combat feels like an amalgamation of the already similar tenets of Dishonored and Far Cry. You can crouch and slink around, you've got your Dishonored style knife to initiate backstabs or decapitations, you've got powers like Shift and Nexus which are just Blink and Domino from Dishonored, but there's a much greater emphasis on shooting than Arcane usually has. Arcane Leon helped develop Wolfenstein Youngblood, which had really good gameplay, and I think that practice really paid off in spades for Deathloop's gun feel. Guns are broken down into pistols, shotguns, heavy machine guns, rifles both single action and sniper, and special weapons that are locked behind optional challenges in the levels. You'll start off with basic guns that sometimes jam, but soon you'll start to see enemies drop better versions like blue and purple and even yellow quality that get increasingly good stats and passive abilities. I wouldn't say it makes or breaks your playthrough to have the very best, as you could technically get by with the second tier of blue weapons if you had to, but purple quality is usually where you'll wind up, as accuracy is tantamount no matter how many abilities you slot into these weapons. This is good if you don't like random loot drops dictating your success in games, but it also kind of feels like a weird inclusion since it seems as tacked on as Control's loot and upgrade system was. But overall, the guns feel pretty decent to aim as long as you've turned off the heinously broken auto-aim which is on by default on Xbox. There are some rough spots, but generally speaking, Arcane's never made a better controlling game. Of course, this is pretty necessary since this is the first Arcane game to feel like an outright shooter. Some of the effects do sound pretty wimpy though, the heavy machine gun sounding like a slot machine, and a good amount of your weapons having this kind of plastic nerf feel to them, which may be a stylistic choice to appear playful more than an outright oversight. The pistols feel good, and their reload animations have flair, but they're usually a little underpowered. And while the DPS of the heavy machine gun means you'll need to keep it on you at all times, I really enjoyed the one-shot, one-stop shop for all your kills weapons, like the shotguns and single-action rifles, which are powerful and sound like it. Aside from the repeating shotgun's wild spread and the reload animation on the rifle glitching out from time to time, the arsenal's good enough if a little tinny and arcade sounding, but it works for the most part, and there are some fun weapons like a charging laser can that the Golden Loot update added. Just don't use the cool looking but extremely weak sniper rifles. Now much like Dishonored, you've got some sweet ass powers to supplement your melee and range weapons. In Deathloop, these powers are called slabs. Shift's teleport is just as fun as it was in Dishonored, though Get Gooders can equip the double jump ability and mantle their way around levels so they can use their equipable slab slots for other abilities. But unlike Dishonored, which has some really cool interplay between powers as well as distinct ways to go through a level leaning on just one or two, Deathloop slabs act much more like Bioshock Infinite's vigors. They just have one obvious function. That's not inherently a bad thing, but you won't be able to do cool mixtures of powers like slowing time as someone fires at you, then possessing them to walk in front of their own bullet to finish themselves off as time resumes. No. Here, Aether lets you become invisible. Havoc buffs your... Bup. Havoc buffs your defense and damage output, Arnesis is basically telekinetic whiplash, 
and the only real indispensable slab I wish I'd used in my first playthrough is Nexus. This thing wrecks ass and really makes some short work of those preposterously big hordes of enemies. This was the major breakthrough in making my second playthrough much more enjoyable, so I'd highly recommend that you start with this one. So, those are your offensive options, but what about the folks you use them on? Most reviewers decry Deathloop's enemy AI as brain dead, and while they're not that dumb, Interesting! How is he here? And while they're not that dumb, Interesting! And while they're not that dumb, I'm almost comforted by the fact that they're not more lethal by the end game because they're not that much fun to fight. The game starts out pretty frustrating already because while these mooks are really just generic guys with guns, they outmatch your weak machine pistol and lack of slabs pretty easily, and nearly a level's worth of them are alerted almost every time you come out of stealth to shoot someone anyway. Much like Far Cry 6, they're really erratic in their movements, so they're easy to lose track of, and like Turok 2008, they have this really annoying habit of not dying but getting knocked down by gunfire, popping back up to stab you in the back when you thought they'd gone down for the count. And while the aforementioned dead space you see in the levels is likely there to give you a place to perch and mark enemies from, I still would have preferred a radar of some kind that kept up with the enemies better so they weren't so easy to lose track of. The default FOV is also way too tight, so turn that crap up and thank me later. Overall, I just found that the encounter design generally feels kind of awful. It's like you're either doing these really easy ghost runs where you're just chaining stealth kills because there's no one around to alert anyway, or you're wading into a crowd pretending you're not going to alert at least one, then one guy of course sees you, the horde is alerted, and you have to sit there and just get swarmed. There's just not a good rhythm or escalation to the way engagements play out. The only thing that made firefights more fun was abusing Nexus like I mentioned before. That can make you feel like a god in most games, but here you feel like the king of fools, like you're just abusing brain dead puppets who can barely defend themselves until they're swarming you. One funny technique that you can abuse this dense AI behavior is to fire off a shot to be heard round the world, aggro all the enemies at once, then camp in a corner and kill them as they file into the only entrance one by one. It's comical, it's stupid, and it's tedious to have almost every firefight become this game of hope I don't waste my lives getting shot in the back by one of the 15 guys I just alerted because I dared not to ghost level. So oftentimes I just went invisible and teleported around to avoid combat. It was that annoying, and I wasn't about to rely on Arcane's patented garbage enemy awareness meter from Dishonored, where enemies are either omniscient or completely blind. It seems likely that Arcane Leon balanced the game this way to make enemies low maintenance, so that you weren't having to restart the loop so often from random deaths or depleted ammo, but the combat ends up feeling only serviceable. Sometimes you get some cool highlight reel kills, but oftentimes you're just engaging clown cars of stupid enemies. Fights lose their rhythm and drama really quickly, so that you feel like you're just playing a budget Far Cry with superpowers. And this speaks again to the flattening technique the whole game feels subject to. Level design felt accomplished, but like it's made for a different game. Enemies feel obnoxiously dumb or omniscient and innumerable, and the actual quest lines feel like going through the motions. Campaign director Dana Nightingale didn't want the player to wander around aimlessly in the level, asserting that players lose enthusiasm when they don't know what the game is asking of you. Well, I'd agree, but what if you make the game too linear and prescriptive in response to that? At what cost comes accessibility? Dishonored definitely had plenty of waypoint markers to tell you where to go, so it can't be Deathloop's fault if its supposed murder puzzle feels awfully linear and tells you each move to make, right? Well, maybe it does after all. The main reason that I replayed all the Dishonoreds before writing this video was that I wanted to be sure I wasn't unfairly criticizing Deathloop for its handholding if I largely let that slide in Dishonored. I found that the difference between the two is that Dishonored shows me where to go to do something that's been built up to be a cool story moment like poisoning the supply in Lockjaw's hideout, or maybe taking on Granny Rags, but Deathloop's objectives usually feel like they can't trust the player to run wild because the story's a little too particular in its construction, so objectives feel less like fun challenges and more like fetch quest to click the thing and make the train of the narrative start choo-chooing along again. All aboard, sweetie. Choo-choo. I said Colt show, <laughs> not Colt. Fuck it. Next stop, security office. Choo-choo. I mean, sure, you can do stuff like taking on Igor the Visionary while he's fully invisible, or you can use a field nullifier to turn off his powers and make him easier to shoot, or you can choose to gas out Harriet's followers so you don't have to fight them too, but these are sort of incidental, there if you want to fool with them flavor bits versus hardcore creativity. Most of the modality of gameplay is down to what offensive option you want to use, and what you end up with is a decent Rambo gameplay loop where you slink around stabbing people until the alert gets inevitably raised and it's time to mow through guys again. 
It's fine, but it's just not terribly remarkable, and most importantly, it's well short of the promised murder puzzle Arcane quacked on about. Why isn't the game more tailored to the promise of its trailer? Why is everything just out there waiting to be clicked on to advance the ticker on a quest line in my menus? It's never a question of gathering all the info in a level like Dishonored allowed and then deciding which path to go down. That's not to say that there's nothing interesting to see or do in Deathloop, but it's few and far between. Frank's aforementioned club is great because you have three different ways to get in. A window, the basement over tough to navigate freezing water, or by using the class pass that turns off your abilities in exchange for free passage. There's even a switch next to the booth where Frank is to draw him out. You can hack all the doors too if you don't want to use the class pass. There are a ton of security and well-placed enemies to make your stealth demanding enough to be interesting, but not putting you over its knee if you mess up. Okay, right on. That's how we am sim. Another great, albeit linear, objective is when you carry a bobblehead of the visionary Alexis that speaks in a hilarious on-loop monologue. When I got your message about this interview, I thought, yeah, fucking my favorite topic. You have to carry it all the way across the level to a computer that'll spoof a message from the recording to convince another visionary to change their plans so you can get the two for one later on. The kicker is that you can't shoot while holding the bobblehead and the obnoxious recording will alert enemies to your presence. So it's up to you to figure out the path of least resistance or to try not to die if you force your way through crowds. This was a really cool mission idea, but wouldn't it have been great if this was one of the ways to perform an assassination like the back of the 10 led on like it could be, instead of the only way to progress this quest line and ultimately take out two characters at the end of the game? It sounds so much like a wackier version of something you'd pull off in Hitman, but it's ultimately just another decent but totally linear objective. Another design annoyance is how many runs or visits to time periods will just be to grab one thing and then leave. One egregious offender is when you go to auto shop to get Frank's fireworks code, only to find a note saying to try again later on the next loop. Like, fuck off. Fuck off. <laughs> just fuck off. There was a glut of these kind of time-wasting runs I'd do where objectives like this would appear, or I'd just be looping round and round trying to farm enough residuum to afford upgrades for my runs later, where I was going to pursue the main objective again. And Dishonored, Deus Ex, Thief, and all the rest, notes and scrawlings around levels educate you so that you can make informed decisions about how the world works and decide which avenue you'd want to go down to progress. You learned things and felt the rush of discovery and reward when you felt like you were on the same page as the developers doing something cool. Deathloop's notes, on the other hand, are basically just keys that once picked up unlock a journal update and inform your route through different times of day. Now, some areas may have nothing for you till the next loop, maybe they will have one update to make before moving on, whatever it is, is all subject to the whims of the narrative. So levels are really streamlined down to focus on not getting seen as you crawl around or making sure you're armed and ready if you do get spotted. And while it makes sense to mark enemies, and it's a nice bonus to be more offensively capable than most arcane games, this Far Cry modality feels disserviced by these phony callbacks to the depth M-Sims normally have, feeling more like a linear FPS with busy work. It's not choice-oriented enough for M-Sim fans, and it makes you fuss about with boring note gathering when you'd rather just be cracking heads. It's sleek, but often frictionless, in the places where you want to feel like the game is noticing you, remembering you, and reacting to you. Feeling like you're a guinea pig on a wheel may be an appropriate metaphor, but it's not an interesting enough gameplay experience. It just needed to be better. That is not what I wanted. What's so crazy about the whole unfulfilled promise of a murder puzzle is that Arcane Leon really thinks they've broken free from Dishonored's limitations with Deathloop. Dinga Bacaba says Deathloop doesn't have a right way to play, feeling more like Death of the Outsider which had no morality system, so you don't get punished with things like more rats if you play High Chaos. Campaign director Dana Nightingale also thinks that Deathloop improved on Dishonored in terms of linearity. I don't feel any interest in making a completely linear campaign again. It's not something I want to do. I fell in love with the way Deathloop is structured, where the player's goals are their own. The idea of saying, okay, mission one, mission two, mission three, that feels like a step backwards for me. I feel like I wouldn't necessarily have a job on a game structured like that. And I'm sure I'd find a way to make it work, but that really shifted my perspective of what we can do in a game. Like, hey, this is actually structured quite similar to an old school RPG. G. We can do that type of structure in this type of game and it works. And that's really exciting for me. Well, Dana, I won't begrudge you having a good time feeling like you grew in your design capabilities, but that take is absolute bullshit. 
Bullshit! It's almost a direct antithesis of what Deathloop and Dishonored stand for. Dishonored's the game with Deus Ex style RPG quest chains. Deathloop has linear ones that advance only if you found the appropriate note or flipped the right switch. Even finding passwords and entering them into a machine to unlock a secret room because the quest marker inaccurately updates the quest log and guides you to the wrong areas to find the other parts of the password, but it also just tells you what the password is. It's not like it requires any research capacity on your part to ascertain what it is where it is, whether it's in a puzzle or actually having to memorize something and enter it later. You don't have to use your head to decipher a key or look at clever environmental clues to figure out the password. You just open a terminal or read something and this information is jotted down for later. Deathloop's ambitious and interesting and different in its own way, but it has none of the flair that Dishonored had. The most pronounced difference between the two is that you were incentivized to replay Dishonored levels at least three or four different ways. Mixing and matching powers, doing ghost or no power runs, and the game's bones were inherently flexible enough to anticipate and accommodate your experimentation. That's incredible design, and it's why I appreciate Dishonored more and more every time I play it. It's not always apparent, but it's there for you to find. Deathloop keeps it really simple, which isn't a crime, but it just means that the highs and lows of the game are going to be much more towards the middle. It gives you no incentive to slow down and comprehend a space based on its context clues, and ends up feeling like you're taking a museum tour or listening to a pitch meeting on one option you might see in an arcane game versus being given a plethora of interesting ones to choose from. Interestingly, I remember seeing an Escapist article saying that Death of the Outsider broke Dishonored for better or worse by removing its chaos system, and one of the reasons given was the contract system, which gave you a gold reward for pulling off a mini objective called a contract. They say, and I quote, The new contract system offers little incentive to get smart, too. You aren't rewarded with particularly stunning narrative insights, nor do missions react to your choices outside of the odd newspaper headline changing. It's a strangely backward approach that, while technically granting more freedom, removes the weight of decisions. And I'd argue that's exactly what Deathloop does. It removes the weight of decisions by making nearly all the decisions just knowing when to pop out and shoot versus when to stay hidden or whether to hack a thing or go around it. Bacop has said that Deathloop has got a lot of mainstream awareness. We struck an interesting balance between mainstream appeal and making something completely weird. Again, I'd argue its mainstreamness compromises the originality of its recipe and the richness of its concept. It's just highly frustrating how out of touch these creatives seem to be about their own work, but at least it's an obvious place of disjointedness that illuminates why its experience can feel so off. And while I could complain about the gameplay's unfulfilling nature all day, the real culprit behind the game never feeling like it takes flight is the story itself. Endings and narrative growth are hugely important to my enjoyment of games. It's why the since patched out stealth sections from Final Fantasy XV ruined an otherwise great first playthrough, or why Hi-Fi Rush's nicely wrapped up conclusion redeemed my many hours of frustration. Deathloop's escalation of events and finales suffer from being almost great to totally flat, which honestly should come as no surprise from Arcane Leon, as most of the Dishonored properties had really flat endings too, but it'd be nice to see some growth here. So let's get into the details. Be forewarned, this section will get pretty spoilery, so skip ahead if you want to save these revelations for your own playthrough. Now, I talked earlier about how bad the writing is. It's hard to understate how obnoxious the script is, with its constant annoying banter enough to make for a spoken blush. Destruction and corruption are forms of creation in themselves. Wow, you sound like a serial killer. What? Destruction and corruption are beautiful forms of creation in themselves. I don't sound like that. You absolutely sound like that. I know you absolutely sound like that. Yeah, see, two can play at that game. You're fucking stupid. Proof for it never happened. In the state of the world today, eons are only hope for the future. That's not to impugn their performers in any way, because they're clearly giving it their all, but the core material is so juvenile and crassly constructed that the end result can only be so good. I have to admit that Colt's voice actor Jason Kelly did make me chuckle a couple of times with lines like, after you break the power boxes, you say, I don't want an prize and fuck a aim. <laughs> or when he mutters under his breath that no wonder Juliana doesn't think he's funny. She keeps hanging up the radio right before his best lines. More talking, my favorite. It's also a very apropos line from late in the game that echoes how I felt any time Colt and Juliana open their mouths. Alexis's bobblehead recording is also side-splittingly funny, but moments like these end up being frustrating because they prove that the writers aren't inept, they just got their focus in the wrong place more often than not. 
Stylistic choices aside, the narrative suffers because of a lack of character moments, the only motivator being the last loop where you get to smoke everyone. Finding the pieces to this Myrtle puzzle is really not a puzzle, but a Lego set with instructions. Now, that's not to impugn Legos, the greatest toys that mankind has ever created, but to underscore that your enjoyment will be in learning to come to grips with how curated the game's moments are to be a specific type of experience. And once you've slogged through all the runs needed to update your quest logs and get as many upgrades as you want for the end game, you'll have one genuinely tense and interesting loop where you get to do all the things in one fell swoop to kill all the visionaries. You'll jam the flaps and the fireworks so that Frank gets caught in the blast, kill Harriet, and then you'll have certain showdowns like the one I barely won at the very end with the sliver of health against the self cloning Wingy, the invisible Igor, and Alexis, who can be taunted into revealing himself by playing his favorite mixtape and drawing him to the dance floor. This part's kind of great and really feels like a culmination of what the game always promised, but I really think the game would have benefited from each level having this type of payoff. Part of Hitman's satisfaction is each level having its own theme, its own little rule sets and cool variables to comprehend and manipulate, all the while working your way to the target. It's always exciting to finally lay eyes on your target and then to pull off the plan you've been trying the whole time. That's what Deathloop is missing until the very last hour or two of its runtime, and it's just a shame. It's also baffling because Dishonored already got this right by making levels orient around targets and giving you cool ways to feel like you're getting distracted by these only in Dishonored moments before you close in for the inevitable target kill. That's not to say Deathloop has no other irons in the fire gameplay-wise, but it severely underserves the family drama that could have made all your repetitive loop runs a lot more compelling. At the beginning of the game, Colt Riley muses twice that he and Juliana must have dated because they're so antagonistic with each other. She must be a jilted lover, right? I'll break your fucking loop and whatever I did to piss you off, I'm sorry. Uh, still there? You never said that before. We dated, didn't we? Just go inside the library. This time I'll let you see yourself out. <sighs> yep, we dated. Turns out that this line is kind of out of line, considering the later revelation that Colt's desire to break the loop so he can return to his lover Lila and their child, whom he later realizes is actually Juliana, grown up. Now, maybe this isn't a faux pas, but a simple misdirect so that the audience isn't even thinking they could be related. But this twist reeks of In the Shadow of the Moon, a Netflix movie about a cop who finds out that a serial killer he's after is actually his own daughter from the future. Both revelations come out of left field, and in Deathloop's case, all Colt can muster is mild surprise, uttering a fuck before moving on. Juliana Blake. No. Come on, no. Fuck. Then when the visionaries have been killed and we enter the end game by meeting with Juliana, we are given a choice between keeping the loop intact or killing the last two visionaries, you and Juliana included. The only problem with this choice is I couldn't have cared less about which they chose, ultimately. My personal preference was to break the loop and sacrifice everyone, as this seemed like the only net positive for the world to be rid of these people for good. Now it's technically the good ending, but it's also kind of a fake off because doing what seems like an actually noble sacrificial thing to kill yourself actually destroys the loop for good, letting you and Juliana return to the real world and carry on your life with no problems. But this ending doesn't let us savor the family connection, although one could argue that Colt's shown no interest in returning to his lover Lila anyway, and really doesn't show any affection for Juliana either, so I'm not even sure how I'm supposed to care. If you shoot Juliana, you remain in the loop by yourself, which is the most worthless of all the endings. You can choose also to not use the antique pistols at all, and you and Juliana will live out the rest of your day as father and daughter. How sweet. These endings are okay, I guess, but really abrupt and really aren't satisfying enough to make them feel like all that came before was worth it. Bacaba has said that arcane games are about the journey, mind you, not the destination. And while that may explain why the Dishonored all had such cut and dry endings, a commitment to mediocrity is still mediocrity. Oh, and the only thing worse than mediocrity? The Golden Loop extended ending that was added for the Xbox version when it hit Game Pass. It continues on after the good ending, but feels akin to Mass Effect 3's shoddy extended cut, but more cringy. Imagine that. For some reason, it played on my Xbox greener than a barley field, and the worst song on the soundtrack plays over it. You thought I'm dead and done. You'll know for sure tonight. I'm rising from my shallow grave. And I'm molding my switchblade tight, cause you can blast me with dynamite. 
Like, I cannot believe human adults made this, much less that other human adults paid them to make it, and then expected other human adults to enjoy this in the thing that they paid money for. <laughs> okay, fine. The chorus is pretty good, but those verses are rancid dog water. Anyway, the Golden Loop ending just seems like a visual backdrop to this awful song, and all the visionary close-ups reminded me that I still had never really seen them enough to know them, much less care about them and relate to them. Like Colt and Juliana, they're written almost entirely in the same voice, so they don't really exist as people, but vessels of repetitive snark. Remember how the twist came and went? That's how Deathloop itself feels. Like it's just a middling story framework that swept through a gameplay loop long enough to call itself a game. Breaking the loop doesn't make the world feel different because it felt so fake beforehand, so impactless. Of course, to a large degree, that was the point of the anomaly's preservation, to feel free of consequence. But when this incidentally affects player satisfaction, when they can't feel like the world really reacted to anything they did, it makes the whole journey feel empty. And don't even get me started on how weird it is that Cult joins up with all the visionaries and Eternals to walk into the sunset like everything's cool at the end. Despite the fact that everyone here is mentally ill and has been killing each other in cold blood for a countless amount of time. I'm sure that's just something you get over though, right? But that ain't the only head scratcher. Why are Juliana and Colt the only ones who remember anything in between loops? I don't think there's any hint of why that is other than it's just the most easy way to design the story. There are also at least one if not two instances in which a past event somehow locks in to all loops in the future once done once, and that's the destroying of Anna's power boxes. Why this one instance out of all of them that you can do throughout the day sticks and never has to be redone again during loops is beyond me, and just seems like a small but kind of glaring plot hole or plot inconsistency. Another weird one is how Colt is able to evade Juliana so easily because he's the only one who knows the passcode to the entry and exit tunnels. Aside from the fact there's a little glass window in the door and the door could easily be blown off if needed, Juliana also has basically infinite amounts of time to attempt all the different combinations to unlock it and wreck Colt's day. This also just seems like a really goofy, improbable contrivance made goofier by the fact that the tunnels are in plain sight. <sighs> Lord have mercy. Now, before I give you my final thoughts about Deathloop as a whole, let's take a quick look at one last cool thing Deathloop does do, and, oh look, it's because of Dishonored yet again. So it's been officially confirmed by Arcane Leon that Deathloop's anomaly is a possible future for the death of the Outsider DLC. The Outsider now out of the picture, the void has started to collapse or seep into the real world, and supposedly why the sky looks all red and gloopy like a lava lamp, and why the time vortex on Black Reap existed in the first place. If you'll notice, these pistols Juliana gives you are said to be vintage and have oil cartridges in them, so it becomes pretty obvious that these are whale oil cartridges and flintlock style pistols like Corvo and company would have used back in the day. I also noticed some cool callbacks like when Colt has the slab ripped off his hand by Juliana at the end and says, that's gonna leave a mark, like a mark of the outsider? Eh? Eh? This connection's pretty neat, and while it doesn't say too much about whatever happened to the Dishonored world after we last saw it, I do appreciate the callback. But even this praise kind of makes me yearn for Arcane Leon's better games, better worlds, and better conceptual execution. Most of what Deathloop gets right was already done better before, and it's not like they didn't lift the Hitman with Bioshock powers template already. And that's where we'll start wrapping things up here. Deathloop just feels like a really cool idea on paper, but it never quite does anything better other than control more smoothly than its inspirations. Sure, its graphics and music are great, its vocal performances are technically strong, and its exact blend of tropes from established franchises is extremely smooth and clever. It's well done. All this, plus the promise of having to use your brain to figure out the murder puzzle was so enticing, but it's not really up to you. And this kind of fake sense of discovery has you doing a linear campaign with more steps, and it's just the worst of both worlds. Deathloop is not a puzzle game, nor are there boundless options on how to play. Anyone who tells you this is just filling up the air with press release speak that they either overheard or were told to say. I cannot stress this enough, that is objectively not the game that Arcane made here, and intentionally so. Deathloop's premise made it sound like the ultimate expression of that Hitman with Bioshock powers mashup that Dishonored prototyped. You were going to be able to line up the perfect kill streak against eight targets, just like how Agent 47 could disguise himself and get to areas to drop chandeliers or poison drinks, and the ensuing deaths would interrupt AI routines and cause them to go on alert or become weak enough to create new openings. Deathloop has almost none of this causality present, except in the scripted way you can play someone's favorite playlist to draw them out to the dance floor and kill them. You do the MSM thing of finding notes or killing a dude or maybe just listening to a log, and the arc of the story dictates how much you end up doing, requiring no real comprehension or retention on your part. 
On the one hand, convenient, quality of life things like journals which map progress are a boon to enjoyment, but Deathloop seems uninterested in you feeling lost enough to ever feel truly rewarded for your exploration or your imagination in creating emergent situations. You'll beat some guys up or find a route to sneak behind them, click on some things, trigger an update in your journal, and then jump to another timeline to make some incremental progress yet again. You'll never really feel that your intuition's paying off like it does in other MSMs, like when you found disparate clues to a safe code or maybe a riddle and are turning knobs and dials and then click, oh, you were right, your smarts paid off. While Cole the character is experiencing these small revelations, the player is never burdened with any of the actual comprehension of the mystery or retention of the facts, and so going through the motions of quote unquote discovering the clues you need to break the loop feels long-winded and tedious, especially when the main goal is known and almost unchanged by game's end. Getting all you need to win the game is too complicated to be open-ended, and yet seemingly needs to let you free in order to justify its existence at all. It just comes off as a game that's too conceptually high-minded to work without constant oversight, which is a real waste of a good idea in my opinion. Instead of Deathloop requiring more and more as Soulsborne games do, it winds up being the most basic, streamlined, primer in arcane ideology imaginable. A resigned market share game hoping to keep itself from obliteration in the hearts of all but the Arden Emsim community. And I get the fear of not having your work recognized or returning the investment of time and energy that you've made. I do make YouTube videos that sometimes do nothing or randomly sprout little wings to ride the algorithmic winds out of nowhere. But the reason this all stands out so sorely is that other games like The Forgotten City shows us that the right balance for a time loop game doesn't even have to be that different to be satisfying. Forgotten City combined a rich narrative that kept upping its stakes while enforcing a timer on some scripted events so that you had to be curious but quick to find out what to do next, all the while learning even when you failed. But this game was more of an RPG than Deathloop tries to be, but notably much more like Dishonored's Choice Trees. The player needs that negative space to imprint upon and feel like they're the agent of change who's still figuring stuff out and not just going through the motions. Deathloop just doesn't hack it. I was even convinced that Deathloop feels a little bit like Bioshock Infinite did years ago for me, kind of compromised and stripped down. My buddy Deadforge actually introduced this idea to me and I think it's a good way to wrap up this section, so let's allow him to elaborate on that for us really quickly. I think Deathloop is Arkane's Bioshock Infinite because it's a game that has a lot of heart and does a lot of stuff Arkane's prior games did great, but it simplified itself down so much to make it mainstream that I feel it lost some of the magic and soul games like Dishonored or Prey had. Deathloop is a mostly linear game with a very set path squeezed into a first person shooter that's very palatable to your average audience. Deathloop suffers from the same identity crisis that Infinite suffered from. Instead of sticking to one idea and doing it well, it tries hard to pull off being a narrative focused FPS, an immersive sim light, a hitman like game, and an odd rogue light that's not really a roguelite. Both have those slight deviations that provide more story that the main narrative chooses not to tell you, but it doesn't feel quite as interesting or engaging as looking for extra lore and world building in prior games. Deathloop is ultimately a really fun game that reminds me of Bioshock Infinite in its very simple nature, but with Arcane's pedigree it feels a lot less creative and fun to mess around with. Both Deathloop and Infinite lost their identity in trying to appeal way too hard to the masses. Deathloop feels like it overcorrected its course to accommodate a mercurial and unreliable minority within Arcane's fanbase. Those folks that complained that the game felt like it was made for an ideal player, a highlight real madman who could pull off incredible stunts and use every inch of the game's possibilities. But this would be like me asking id Software to dumb down Doom Eternal's incredibly balanced, chess-like combat so that a player like me could excel, a player that got stuck on the con maker and the icon of sin on Hurt Me Plenty, enough to where the game asked me if I wanted the armor power-up to help me out. I'm not terrible, but I'm not the ideal player, and that's okay. But just like id Software shouldn't change their winning formula to account for players like me who want to just indiscriminately shotgun everything like Doom 2016 allowed, Arcane Leon really shouldn't have taken these complaints from a vocal minority that seriously and revamped Deathloop accordingly. When you lower the floor from more middle ground fun, especially in a complexly crafted and balanced immersive sim, you appeal to the audience that's the least likely to come your way and you compromise the heights of your vision from middle ground people pleasing so that the game plays out mostly the same for every player because its skill floor is now so and demanding. This middle ground mentality affects so many AAA games these days, and it's why even high production value games like the Assassin's Creed or the Far Cry's will likely always feel mostly okay, sometimes even be pretty good, but they often lack a lot of soul and fire because they're afraid to ask too much of the player in order to get that dopamine hit. In Deathloop's case, the gameplay and level design they settled on are understandable in context of their ambitious ideas, but executed so conservatively and so blandly that the final result underwhelms. 
But modern games have been doing this shit for too long now. Developers have been hiding behind the notion that they want the biggest player base all the time, and to do so, you don't need to bully them away by accident by making your game unapproachably hard. But what we've gotten is a lot of fine games that peak early and do almost nothing beyond just some basic satisfaction and game feel. We have a higher average game quality than we used to, but fewer standouts. And many games that could be great languish in mediocrity because they don't want to entice the player to try a little harder, think a little bigger, and get that much more reward. Placating the casual consumer ends up alienating the core fan base and, honestly, the core value of the product. It's becoming a really bad cop-out to pretend that players are the problem. Developers are getting more and more comfortable shipping the minimum sellable product of not putting anything but money on the line instead of treating this like it's a turn or burn type of situation. Like making the best art is the most important goal and not just making quotas or deadlines. Now I understand that plenty of this pressure comes from non-creatives and create situations like the Cyberpunk 2077 launch, but no matter where the pinch is happening, it just needs to end like 10 years ago. The gaming industry has gotten way too big for its britches and is so worried about keeping up with the Joneses that it neglects to be anything but games for the present day, as forgettable as a workday after you punched out. And if you're making creative endeavors like a factory worker, then you honestly need to vacate the space because you're doing no one a service, not even yourself. This little diatribe isn't strictly a jab at Arcane, mind you, it's more of a Ubisoft and Bethesda and other big wigs who follow suit kind of problem, but Arcane's guilt-oriented priority shift because of complaints doesn't service anyone but the unthinking, simple-minded player who doesn't want to be present or achieve much of anything but a shopping list of objectives. And I should know that even as someone who appreciates a good brain-dead game every now and again because I just want to feel good, that sometimes, and especially when you got the chops to make something more interesting than not, you should make that thing or at least try. Maybe this is just a stepping stone game for Arcane, but judging by Redfall's Far Cry feel, I don't have high hopes that Arcane at large will be keeping the classic MSM formula alive in the modern age. Maybe that's just a sign of the times and they can't afford to bankrupt themselves making timeless art that just whiffs in the marketplace. And it's not right of me to assume I get to determine their bottom line and how to pursue it, but I do get to assume that no matter how pragmatic, these decisions make for a lesser interactive and interesting experience. Deathloop may want you to break the loop, but the only loop I am seeing broken is the one where Arcane remained true to its strengths. I get why they did it. It's likely they won't explicitly admit this, but the reason Deathloop and very likely why Redfall looks so far cry-esque is that they realize that this sneaker shoot in a big level gimmick is the closest thing to the Arcane formula on the market and they need to lean into it. It's also no secret that even their popular games don't sell all that well, and that's too bad, truly. But it makes sense, because the greatness of those games is their depth, their attention to detail, and all those things that require the player to more actively engage them, rather than just being pushed along a track and given an easy dopamine rush. The rush is delayed and often sits more at a moderate level, but it can last for longer and transform into new varieties, into new highs because of Arcane's breadth of power options and builds that can make the station hostile to you or not in prey, or maybe the world is super hard to traverse and dishonor because you'd rather bull rush through levels than selectively pick off bad guys, etc, etc. But I'd be sick of my great work not getting the returns it deserved too. And hell, this giving into market forces may be what keeps Arcane going in the future. But this then begs the worst question of all. If they're assimilating to the market, then will we ever see anything quite as interesting and innovative as their previous work? Raven Software is known for their amazing catalog of games and they can make almost any genre they tackle sing, whether it's brawlers like Marvel Ultimate Alliance or X-Men Origins Wolverine, or third-person action-adventure games like Jedi Outcast to first-person shooters like Wolfenstein 2009, Singularity, or Soldier of Fortune. But we've not seen anything like this from them in recent years because they've been put to work in the Call of Duty franchise. That's not to discredit any work they've done there, but the scope is very specific and the emphasis is iteration, not innovation, tuning the old versus creative brand new. I'd hate to see that happen to Arcane Leon. They're too talented to ever make a truly bad game, which Deathloop is certainly not. It's just a disappointingly misleading one. Despite Bacaba's bold prediction that I'd either love it or hate it, I've made peace with the enemy that is apathy towards Deathloop. It may be the lesser of two evils, but it was ultimately the only way to break this loop. It, uh, worked? Okay. Here goes. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. A great big shout out to my patrons, Mark Neubauer, Deadforge, Shantiva, and Hey Blondie. You guys rule.